I'd like to say hi and welcome to everyone who made it through the snow. <laughs> to me, it's an adventure. <laughs> uh, I'm the new director. I'm Shelly Williams. I moved up here a year and a half ago from Indiana, and so I'm not used to snow, but I'm thrilled to death we have it. I've been asking for it for two years, and the board's going, now you have it, are you happy? <laughs> um, tonight is our first family night of this season. It's our second environmental series program. For those of you who don't know what's going on there, we wrote a grant to the um, Humanities Council. It was a very large grant, and we got that one, and it has started a whole project that we're doing um, to collect personal stories about the environment and the uh, environmental history of the White Lake area. So this goes all back through all the pollution and getting through it, and now we're coming off the, the bad list. <laughs> So we're going to celebrate that hopefully this year. Uh, if anybody hasn't seen it for that project, we have a website. It's called RestoringWhiteLake.com. There's no www in front of it, and it will have. We're going to be putting up people's stories, pictures, whatever artifacts, uh, pictures of things that we can find and get. So if you have a story, or if you have something that you would like to contribute, we'll scan it in and then put it on digitally, and you can keep your items. Um, and then we're going to collect all of this information. We hope in a year or two to have a book written about this. And mostly it's just people's personal stories about how they dealt with the environmental impact of everything that came in this area. And what these programs are, we wrote another grant. And that was to the White Lake Community Fund of the Community Foundation for Muskegon County. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Uh, they gave us a grant to provide this series of environmental programs that we've done for family nights. I was hoping to see kids, but I see adults read them <laughs> when they come in. That's great. I'm glad to have you. Um, and we want to thank both of the uh, funders for the money for the projects that we're doing. We will be having these environmental programs every other month through about September or October, I think is when we go through. So this is our second one. The, we are being videotaped. The program will then be put up on this website. You can go to it, and you'll be able to watch it again just in case you missed something. Um, tonight, we have Jackie Huss with us. From She's the curator of education at the Lakeshore Museum Center. Everybody knows where that is, I hope. I have to go find it. <laughs> uh, and she's going to talk to us about lumbering on the White River and what it involves, what happened, and I'm going to let all you right. tell them what all you're talking about. All right. In just a second. <laughs> also, as I said, this is our first family night of the season. Uh, you probably know Miss Virginia. Uh, she does all the family nights. And next, next week, January 31st, they're going to have a free movie on the big screen for families. So bring kids. And then February 7th is the Science of Magic. And we have these little flyers out there so you can see uh, what's going on. I also have these bookmarks, if you want one afterwards, that tells about the Restoring White Lake Project. All it's right. now your turn. All right, so for those of you that don't know, Lakeshore Museum Center is located in Muskegon, but in the next couple years, we will be having a site up here in Whitehall um, over at Hilt's Landing. It's going to be, um, it's called Michigan's Heritage um, Park, and so it's going to be a um, kind of walk through history with different um, stops um, about Michigan history. So you'll be seeing more of our lovely purple shirts and staff up in this area over the next couple years. Um, and if you want to know more about the museum, I did bring uh, some brochures and bookmarks that are on the table over there. You can pick up on your way out if you don't already have one. Um, as Shelly said, that being a family night, I was expecting a few kids, but that's okay because I have a lot of great history information that I was personally thinking was more adult appropriate, so it'll work out well to have mostly adults. Um, and so we'll go ahead and get started. So as she said, we're gonna be talking about lumbering, um, the process and the impact um, on the White River. And so we'll start out with talking about the process of lumbering and, um, and what actual tools were used and things like that. Um, as you can see, I brought lots of hands-on examples. Um, and then we will um, talk a little bit at the end about some of the impacts that it had on the environment. Um, so in the 1830s, 1840s, and 1850s is kind of the birth of lumbering in West Michigan. And um, 
um, most of the men that came to West Michigan to start in the lumber business were pretty adventurous. That wasn't an easy place to get to. Um, there wasn't a lot of help here in the early years, and so it was a pretty um, rough um, start for a lot of lumber, what became known as lumber barons. Um, but those of that stuck with it, as we know, became, became very wealthy from this industry. Um, so lumbering, like I said, in White House started out pretty small. They were harvesting trees really close to White Lake. And then as those trees were harvested, they started moving further north along the White River. Um, so does anybody know how they got the logs as they started to move up the White River? I'm sure a lot of you know, but how they got the logs down, the, down to White Hall? Anybody? They used the river, yeah. So they would float them right down the river. Um, so we'll be talking a little about, about that because that obviously had some impacts on the river. Um, and most of the time, um, or for most of the early years of lumbering, up until the late 1880s, 1890s, mo majority of the lumbering was done in the winter because that was the time that it was easiest to actually transport the logs to the river. So the further they got away from the river, they could then slide on sleds um, or even just right on the snow and ice um, to the river banks, and then they would put the logs in the river in the spring. Um, so lumberjacks obviously use a variety of tools. So like I said, that's what we're going to start out with talking about. Um, so the first one we'll talk about are the crosscut saws and axes. Um, they're, in the early years, they didn't actually have saws. They used uh, mainly just the axes. And an example of the type of axe that they used look like this. This is called a two-bitted axe, obviously, for two blades. Um, and so in the early years, this is what they used to chop down trees. And lumberjacks used, liked to use a lot of nicknames. So the men who cut down trees using axes, their nickname was the choppers. And um, obviously, the two blades helped them save a lot of time because they could do twice as much work with one axe without having to stop and have it sharpened partway through the day. Um, so it did help them save a little bit of time. Um, and then after they started using the saws, which I'll um, hold that one up in just a minute. But after they started using the saws, um, they also um, still use these axes, though, for cutting off branches. And the men whose job was to go around to all the trees that had been felled and cut off the branches, they were called swampers. And so that was another job that lumberjacks could have. All right. So then the other um, main tool that you can see in this photograph is the cross-cut saw. So. This is always a favorite when I do it with school kids because I have a giant drawer that I pull it out of. Oh, and look at, we have some kids here. Do you guys want to be my helpers and hold some tools? <laughs> They're like, I don't know. Do you want to come up and help me hold the saw? One of you girls want to help him hold the saw? Okay. So if you want to grab that end, and then if you want to come over and grab that end, you're going to hold it with two hands and you're going to face each other. Yep, so kind of face him. And I want you guys to kind of practice and see if you can push and pull this saw. And then I'm going to let go. Okay, see how it's sagging there? The really important thing with the crosscut saw is to keep it nice and tight and to be really fast. Obviously, these are some junior lumberjacks here, probably not fast enough to get a job in the lumber camp because lumberjacks were expected to cut down a pair of lumberjacks to cut down 20 to 25 trees a day. And basically, that was almost the equivalent to the speed of a chainsaw today because we're talking about pretty large trees. All right, guys, I'll help you hold it. So you guys think you would get blisters if you did this all day? on your hands yeah and you'd have some pretty strong muscles thank you guys for that help so the men who used the crosscut saw were called fallers because they made the tree fall not the most creative name but that was a nickname that they had set that around and if any adults want to get a closer look after the program you're welcome to come up and look at my tools as well all right, so once they had the tree on the ground, like I already said, they used the ax to cut off the branches. The swampers did that. Um, and then the next job was the marking of the logs. And so um, your library actually has a nice display over there of some different um, local log marks. But basically, the marks for each lumber camp 
had to be designed and then registered with the county. So the first thing uh, um, lumber owner, lumber mill owner, or maybe one of his higher up in his office would do is come up with a design. So like my hammer here has the mark HD on it, but you can see over there, there's lots of different designs, um, pictures and symbols that they could have. And really the only rule or the only rules were that it couldn't be the same as somebody else in the um, county. So you couldn't have the same mark as somebody else. And then it had to be something that could be made into a hammer. So you couldn't have anything too intricate or fancy. A lot of people wonder, okay, did they heat it up and burn the end of the log? But actually it was just basically the sheer force of swinging this large hammer into the end of the log as hard as they could. And remember that it's green fresh wood. All the log ends that you see now are dried out wood. So it'd be a lot harder to stamp or mark. But back when they were first cut, it wasn't super hard to make that mark. And they were expected to hit the end of the log about five times on each end. I'll get this one here. And I'll pass this one around. You guys can look a little bit closer at it. But they were expected to um, hit this one about five times on each end because basically once it was in the river, you didn't want, um, you wanted one of your marks to always be sticking out of the water. So if it's half underwater and it's rolling around on each end, you always want at least one mark sticking out. So once they, um, just to go back, once they had their mark registered with the county, um, then the county would keep a record of that so nobody in the future could have the same mark as you. And then you could go to your local blacksmith and have your uh, marking hammer made and there might only be two or three of them made for each camp but what's kind of interesting about these log marks is that they were um, bought and sold like property so if a sawmill was going out of business they might sell the um, marking hammers and the, and the rights to that mark along with their company or they might sell it to a different company so um, in the books then you had to go to the back to the county office and have it transferred to the new owner and so we actually have an original um, one of those books from the county in our archives at the museum and so under one mark there might be eight or ten different um, sawmills and then the years that they actually were the owners of that. So it's kind of a confusing business. We'll talk a little bit more about it um, later about the men who actually had to recognize these marks to do the sorting of the logs later because the whole point was once they got in the river they got mixed together, they got down to the lake here in Whitehall, and they had to be sorted back out to the sawmills that they belonged to. So I'll go ahead and pass this one around. It's got that mark KT on there. Some of them are a little bit easier to see than others. Um, and then this one up here I just brought with me because it is a Whitehall mark, although you guys got a bunch of them here. I didn't see this one over there. This is from the Bonona Lumber Company. So it's kind of neat, it's a sailboat. So if you want to see this one a little bit closer afterwards, you're welcome to come up and take a closer look at it. So after the log was marked, or sometimes before, these two jobs kind of it didn't matter what order you did them in. The next job was to measure the logs or scale the log. So they had to already know the length of their logs, which they usually cut in a standard length so they could fit it on their sled. So if they had a 14 foot sled, then they cut their logs at 14 feet lengths. Um, but then once they did that, the scaler job was to find out how many board feet were in a log. So for our younger people in the audience that might not know what a board foot is, a board foot is 12 inches by 12 inches and one inch thick. So once they knew how many board feet were in a log, then they knew how much money the log was worth, or they could estimate how much money the log was worth. So basically to figure out the board feet, you need to know the length and the diameter of a log and then there's a math equation to do that. However, lumberjacks didn't want to sit there and do their longhand math equation. And so somebody invented these um, scale sticks where once you knew the length of the log, you found your column at the bottom. So if we had that 14 foot long log, we would um, measure across the diameter of the log like they're doing there. So this is just another type of it. But they'd measure across the diameter of the log and figure out, okay, if my log is went from here to here, what is that number? 766 board feet for a log that 
wide or that big of diameter that's 14 feet long. And so the scaler's job was to record all of that so that his bosses could kind of tr keep track of their profitability, um, you know, from week to week, month to month to, to kind of estimate how much money it was going to make once it finally got to the sawmill. Um, now, another nickname, though, for this was the cheat stick because there's a couple different theories why it's called the cheat stick. Probably the most logical is you were cheating the math. You didn't have to do the math. So it's a cheat stick in that that you don't have to do the math. But another um, kind of saying that might have been called the cheat stick is because a log is not a perfect circle. The scaler would always find that if it was oval shaped, find the biggest diameter, if it had a knot coming out of it, always write down the bigger number, make it look like it was worth a little bit more money. Another name they might have called it the cheat stick. Third reason they may have called it the cheat stick and they sometimes called the man using it, the cheater, is he wasn't super popular in lumber camps because he made more money than the rest of the lumberjacks. He was educated, had to know math, had to know how to read and write, had to know English. A lot of lumberjacks, a lot of times English was definitely their second language. And so um, this was a higher paid job. So he was kind of not maybe sometimes the most popular guy in the lumber camps. That guy's using the white part. Yeah, yeah, he is. There's a little knot even coming out of the side of that log there. And this is a little bit later picture. You can tell by the way the guys are dressed, but one of, one of the few we have of them actually using scale sticks. Um, so then after the logs were scaled and marked, they were brought to the river. Um, in early years, like I said, they did this during the winter with sleds. So if they were a mile or two from the river, they would have to load them up on the sleds using ramps and pulleys. <laughs> Um, the horses would, or oxen would pull the sleds to the river and then they'd pile them up next to the river. Um, this picture though shows obviously a train there. And so at um, one point they finally added the train, one of the lumber companies, and I don't have um, this picture, unfortunately we don't know which lumber company's logs these were but they added a train to the operation, um, probably a narrow gauge rail, and so that they could get the logs to the river even easier than using the horses. And then you can see that they kind of tipped it and basically probably took a, um, the railings off of this side so that they could roll down into the river. Um, and so they would do that in the spring as the snow was melting and the river was starting to rise and move a little bit faster. And then, as most of you probably know, the lumberjacks would go down the river with the logs, um, basically to keep an eye out for log jams um, and also to watch out for log pirates. All of these log ends that you see here or at our museum, those have all been found in the woods in Michigan, and those are all a product of log piracy. Basically, men, usually at night, or if they found a nice deserted stretch during the day that they didn't think they were going to get caught, they would pull logs out of the river, saw off the ends, throw those ends out into the woods, put their own mark on the log, and push it back in the water. So KT here, um, or our Bonona Lumber Company here, they did not get the log. They did not get the money for this log. Somebody found these logs out in the woods. Um, a lot of times, 1920s, 1930s, it was really popular to go walking out in the woods um, looking for those logs. We probably have four or 500 log ends in our museum collection, and we're just one museum. And then people, a lot of times, have them in private collections. So this was a really popular thing to do, is to steal other lumber companies' logs. Um, so then once the logs finally got down to the mouth of the river, they had to be sorted. And so this is a picture of the sorting grounds here in Whitehall. Um, and basically there were men that worked for what was known in Whitehall as the Whitehall Booming Company in Muskegon. It was the Muskegon Booming Company. Basically the boomers, the men who worked for the booming company, um, were independent from all the, all the sawmills. So if there were 18 or 20 sawmills on White Lake, they were basically, um, the company was owned by shares of all of the separate lumber companies. So you owned 1 18th of this booming company so that it was fair. These men were supposed to be independent so that they didn't slip somebody a few extra logs as they were sorting them. And so they would stand on these kind of um, docks in the river that separated um, the logs into pens or corrals. I kind of like it to compare it to corralling cattle. They would look at the mark and they would slide it into the corral that belonged to. So the Colville sawmill had one corral, the Ferry sawmill had another corral, and they would sort those logs um, according to who they were belonged to. Once they got them into the corral at the mouth of the river, they then had to be chained together. And so the system that they came up with was to use a snub ring, or nickname for this was a dog, 
they would have to go around in each log and pound two or three of these into the log. And they called them dog and chains. That was kind of the nickname for it, but the official name was a snubbering. They'd pound the dog in there and then they could run chains through these loops. And they came in all different shapes and sizes. I've seen ones that aren't so nice. They don't, don't have the moving ring. It's a fixed ring. Um, just depends on who made them. These are all obviously handmade items. And so these would be pounded in. Chains um, would chain them together like big rafts. And then um, usually a tugboat would actually come and hook onto that raft of logs and pull it to the sawmill that it belonged to. So I can go ahead and pass this around too because it's a small, easy thing to pass around. Then once the logs were tugged to the sawmill that they belonged to, they um, then had to be unchained and um, those had to be taken out. So there was a whole separate tool made called a snubbering puller, which I unfortunately, unfortunately don't have with me. But basically imagine a crowbar on a really long stick so that you didn't have to bend over and you would stick that crowbar um, through the under the loop and pry it up and then they would just keep doing that and stick them on a um, kind of a chain on their belt and um, had to take them all out before they could go up into the sawmill. Um, so the sawmill here um, is, uh, you might be able to see at the bottom there, is the CE and MB Colville sawmill. So Colville was one of the bigger lumbering families in White, the Whitehall area. Um, I have some pictures of some other sawmills though. Um, oh, the last step, I forgot. The last step is to ship the lumber. So this one a picture I found kind of interesting because you'll notice the ship is the C.H. Hackley. Um, so this picture was taken around 1895. And in 1895, lumbering was kind of ending in Muskegon. And the Hackley and Hume Company owned a lot of their own ships. Some lumber companies owned their own ships. Other lumber companies rented ships or um, kind of contracted with a ship's captain for the summer. And so because lumbering was slowing down in Muskegon, chances are Hackling Hume did not need all of their ships for their lumber company. So they were subcontracting out their ships to other um, lumber companies. And so we know that this one was up in Whitehall um, in 1895. And then you can probably see on there, where did all the lumber mostly go? Chicago, yep, that is kind of the hub for the Midwest. So the ships made constant round trips from the time that the ice broke in the spring as early as early, like late April, early May, till as long as they could go in November, early December, um, bringing lumber down to Chicago. Um, a lot of times they would dry the lumber because it's fresh wood. Um, sometimes some lumber companies had drying barns that they would heat up really hot. Um, kind of like a kiln to, to, to dry out that wood. Other times they just stacked it out on the deck and waited it, to, it might take a month or two to kind of air dry. Um, and then they would stack it up on the ship. And I always tell the kids, here is the hardest job I think of all of the lumberjacks were the men called dock wallopers. Their sole job, they wore leather aprons, big leather gloves. Their sole job was to pick up as big a stack of lumber as they could carry and basically kind of walk the plank onto the ship, stack it up, go off and get another one constantly. So today when you think about how the cranes just do it automatically and you know there's no manpower in it, this was a pretty tough job. And basically that was their only job. So if there wasn't a ship in port, like in Muskegon, we know that they would sit on the porch of the Occidental Hotel and wait till they saw another ship come and then they'd run down and do it again. But they basically got breaks in between because it was such a tough job to do the loading of the ship. Um, so that's the last step. Once it got down to Chicago, it would be unloaded and um, either used for building in Chicago because they were a big purchaser of Muskegon County lumber, but also loaded on trains so that they could then be sent out all around the country to whoever needed the lumber. Um, so this picture here is of the first steam sawmill on White Lake. And does anybody know who it belonged to? The first steam? Yep, ferry. Does anybody know who the very first sawmill belonged to? No. Nope. Mears, yep. So the very first mill was built by Charles Mears in 1838, um, and that was a water-powered mill. And I'll have a map in a minute that shows where that one was located. Um, and then the first steam mill was built in the early 1850s um, by William Ferry. So. Um, like I said, I'll have a map of that in a second. And then this is the picture I had on my intro slide. Um, again, another Colville mill. So he had um, multiple operations and or multiple partners throughout his career, just like Charles Hackley had 
Um, he was in partnership with his father, um, a man by the name of McGordon, and then finally Thomas Hume. Uh, Mr. Colville had different um, partners throughout the time. But I really like this one because it does show the the Whitehall kind of downtown area as well as the sawmill and the ship. So it's just kind of a neat picture there. Um, so here's the map I was talking about. So the first mill on White Lake was located here. The, um, the what was it now I'm forgetting, the Mears Mill. Um, and then the first steam mill was over here on the old channel. Um, so as most of you probably know, Whitehall's original channel went kind of up like that and out to Lake Michigan. And it was in 1871 that they finally completed this channel, which was lobbied for to the US government by the lumber barons of the Whitehall area because um, without that channel, there was not a reliable way to get their ships into um, the White Lake. Um, and so a lot of times, as you can see, it made more sense to put your mill way out here, but that meant that you were tugging your logs all the way here before you could even turn them into boards. So once the channel opened in 1871, you can see most of the sawmills then were built closer to the river so that the logs didn't have to be taken quite as far and then the ships could just come right into the dock at the mill instead of having to find a way to get the finished lumber out to the ships out in Lake Michigan or just inside um, the kind of rivery channel there. Um, this one, this red arrow, arrow up here is that um, Koval um, Okobach mill. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Akabach. Akabach. And that mill was built um, in 1865, so 15 years after this. Um, so they, they were, were actually built before the channel was finished. But if, if I were able to blow this picture up, you would be able to see that a lot of those mills were built after 1871 or right around 1871. Okay, so... This, that's kind of the process. Now let's talk a little bit about how did it affect the river, the lake, and the forest. So there's lots of different um, effects that lumbering had on the White Lake area, the Muskegon area, anywhere that you were doing this lumbering. Um, one of them was what we just talked about, the channel. We probably, maybe eventually they would have put a channel in, but if it weren't for the lumbering, that first man-made channel out to Lake Michigan would have come much later. And as a result, the lighthouse would have come much later as well, because um, they were put in about the same time. Um, also, this is another picture of the booming grounds. Just look at what they did to the edge of the river. So before lumbering got here, trees, brush, everything was right up to the edge of the river. And as the lumber companies grew, they basically um, logged right next to the White Lake and White River. And then they worked further and further away as they um, depleted the lumber source. But they were um, removing basically any sort of natural vegetation um, that would help keep um, erosion from happening, that would help um, protect the riverbanks. And at the same time, as they were cutting logs, they were um, kind of filling in any marshy area that was along the river or Along the, along the edge of the lake with that sawdust or scrap wood or anything that they didn't want. They didn't care. They just threw it right in the river and it filled in basically those edges of the rivers and the lakes um, as they were lumbering. Um, and so those were two really big impacts. I mean, imagine if you were a fish that originally lived in this river and then all of a sudden, not only were there, you know, the plants couldn't grow, um, there's all these men and ships and logs covering your river, all these man-made things. It really um, changed and kind of disturbed the ecosystem that was going on in the river as well as the lake. Um, and then also the forest, that's a huge one that, um, that a lot of people don't think about, but the, most of the forests that we have here in Michigan today are only about 75 to 80 years old. They were planted during the Great Depression. The Civilian Conservation Corps um, planted a lot of the trees that we see today because what the lumberjacks left behind were basically any scrub trees that, they, that wasn't worth their time cutting down. And then as they cut off those branches, that swamper cut off the branches, they just left all of that lying on the ground, that discarded brush. And a lot of that dried out and then um, any sort of lightning storm or even just a careless lumberjack's fire is going to start a forest fire. And they actually lost more trees to forest fires during this time than to the lumberjacks themselves cutting the trees down. They thought that the lumber in Michigan would last 500 years, but it barely lasted a little over 50 years because of um, 
increased technology, they were able towards the end to cut trees down much faster and they started going to year round logging. But more than that was the forest fires that were caused a lot of times by the lumberjacks themselves and definitely because of the brush and the dried out branches, um, pine branches that they left behind. Um, so here's another picture of kind of what the forest looked like when they were done with it. So as I mentioned during the 1930s, the Civilian Conservation Corps came into Michigan and they did it all over the country. They planted trees. However, in Michigan, Michigan, we actually um, planted 484 million trees um, during the late 1930s and early 1940s, and that was more than twice as many than any other um, state in the country. And so that was a huge um, boost to Michigan's economy at the time, but also gave us some of the forests that we have today. Um, so today, as most of you probably know, when lumber companies cut down trees, they are now required for every tree that they cut down, they don't have to replant it in the exact same place, but they do have to be planting a tree somewhere else to replace it. So it is a renewable resource, you know, that we can obviously plant and, and grow more, but they weren't super responsible back in the 1800s. And so we are just now getting the results of those um, trees that were planted in the, um, in the 1930s. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. Does anybody have any questions about the tools or any of the process or the photos that I showed today? Yeah. Why did they dry the lumber before they stacked on the ship? Was that to decrease the weight? Um, decrease the weight and also for building um, so that when it finally did get to market, it was something you could build with because you don't want to build with the wet lumber. Um, you're not going to get the best results. So, um, but a lot of times, the decrease in the weight would be a big factor because you could hold more on your ship. Oh, another question here. Hey, um, I'm curious about any any uh, trees, you know, logs that were cut down that mm -hmm. were never reclaimed, sank, sank under the water, any of that? Yeah, that does happen. I don't know specifically here in Whitehall. I'm sure that um, in the process of dredging, people have pulled up um, logs. I know in Muskegon, we have one of our logs that's on display was one that in the process of dredging, I want to say in like the late 80s, um, was pulled out. And it's a pretty sizable log about this big around um, because it got water logged. So most of the lumber they got through the mills within that summer that they you know brought it down in the spring and they got it through. But every once in a while, it would get left in the water too long and get water logged and sink. So there probably is still a few out there, I'm sure. Is there any way to preserve them once they come up out of the muck? Um, that's a really good question. I am not sure what we did to ours if they just dried it out. Ours did have the mark on it. It's EXE. And I can ask our director, um, John McGarry, if he was around when that log came in. He might know what we did um, to preserve it. But um, as far as I know, they just basically let it dry slowly, you know, naturally. And then um, it's in pretty good shape, the one we have. So. Is it indoors or outdoors? It's indoors. Yep, it's in our Coming to the Lakes gallery in our sawmill exhibit. So. Yes. We were talking about when they built the channel. Mm -hmm. Are you speaking of the channel that's there now? Yeah, the channel that we consider, you know, the White Lake Channel. What year did you think that was done? Um, 1871. That's according to the Lighthouse's website. I mean, the exact walls and everything probably were not there, but the channel was dug. It probably had more like rock edges, you know. I'm sure they've done upgrades. The um, Army Corps of Engineers has done upgrades over the years, but the original channel was cut so that the ships could come in in 1871. Yep. So what sticks up out of the out of White Lake there when you cross the bridge going into Montague? Are probably pilings Is that from old leftover from the um, from the actual structures of the mills because the sawmills were actually built out over the water on docks. And so basically as people tore down and you know reclaimed the lumber from the docks, sometimes those pilings that held up the structures were left behind. Those were the docks that the For the booming ground? Okay, yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So because this, the mills were steam powered, they were actually right out uh, over the water and then below them was kind of where the steam boiler was and then they could suck in the water from the lake to power the saws. But yeah, so. I'm sure yes. there must have been people that came up here from the stinking, but in my youth there were just hundreds of log marks. Mm. Because of the way I was told was a 14 foot log became a 12 foot, and maybe it became a 10. <laughs> yeah. And all the two ends got. Yeah, yep. Off that so three marks. And, uh, and there was just, I mean, yeah. you could pick them up. 
Yeah, I mean, there's some people that, that the reason we have this one in a little square is because some men, you know, in the 30s and 40s would collect them, just cut out the mark, and then they'd have whole boards of all the different log marks. So um, I know we have a couple different people that have donated to our museum that had huge collections of log ends or just the mark itself. Yeah. Yes? Your scaler looked like he was scaling on a fresh cut tree mm -hmm. up on dry ground before it hit the river. Right. Before the pirates got to it. Correct. And he's keeping a record of all of Yeah, so when then they get so to the... Now, when the mill owner mm -hmm. and his bookkeeper look at all this stuff at the end of the year, they can see then that they've been pirated. Yeah, basically, and it happened to, I'm sure every single lumber company out there was pirated, and the thing of it is, is if, you know, Colville was stealing from Ferry, Ferry was stealing from Colville, and, you know, they were all stealing from each other because um, I doubt that there was a single completely honest lumber baron out there that wouldn't allow his men to do that. There may have been a couple, but for the most part, it kind of happened all around, crossed each other. But yeah, if they if they weren't lucky enough to get enough from other, other lumber companies, then they would see yeah, the difference in their their out their output of lumber. Yes? Yeah, we're just for clarity, we're strictly talking about white pine here. Yeah, yep, in this area. Um, basically, from my understanding, it was the white pine was kind of like from a line north, and there were harder woods um, more to the south. And so um, for Muskegon, Whitehall, you know, um, Ludington, these areas to the north, um, they were pretty much exclusively putting out white pine. Well, the other reason they did cut it was it wouldn't float. Right, that too. So it wasn't until, yeah, they could have the trains that went out into the woods and, and brought the lumber back, yep. Yes? You know, that first photo that you showed uh, with the oak meat um, had basically, uh, you can see the outlines of the, uh, that one. Yep. And if you see where the dock is, that's the, that's the coval mill behind mm -hmm. thing. Yep. And, and you can still see the edgings and things like that. Yep, so this is kind of the... Um, in, in the lake today. Yep. Oh, the, that's a log float there. Yep, this was what held the logs in, and then you've got the dock where the... It came out like that, and then that's over the water there, that sawmill, or even that one's not as good of an example. Also, yeah. I think it's fascinating. They always have fire prevention. It's all the yep, the wooden barrels up there. So young boys, not much older than the kids here, that maybe their job was to sweep up the um, sawdust and kind of help out around the sawmill. If there was a fire, they were the ones that were set up on the roof with axes to break the barrels open to hopefully put out the fire. It didn't usually work, but it helped a little bit maybe. Did yeah. they have any intention of cleaning the rest of that out of the lake there as part of the restoration project? Are they going to leave that in for history or what's... Does anybody know on that? I think it's, it's kind of just there. I mean, it's in over years been covered with all sorts of things. I mean, I know in, um, I'm sure it's the same case in Whitehall. I know I'm from Muskegon, so I know more about Muskegon, but um, I'm sure that there's probably, how, you know, buildings built on top of what they filled in because if you look at old maps, um, and I'm sure the same would be true here, the shoreline and where your road is that you think is maybe two blocks off the water, used to be right on the water, and then they filled in, and so then now there's another road there that, like in Muskegon, if you're familiar with Muskegon, Western Avenue used to only be about a block and a half from the water, but now you've got another block down, you've got Shoreline Drive, and then you have a, the Mart Dock going out into the water, so it's pretty much permanent now. I was told that Mart Dock is built yeah. with sawdust. Yep. Yep, it is, because I was just today with a class in our archives looking at a map, and Western is literally the last road before you got to Muskegon Lake, and so that's all filled in. <laughs> yep, completely changed the outline of these lakes, Whitehall, Muskegon. And I'm sure they may have had the same problem in, that we have had in Muskegon where they're trying to maybe put in a bridge like over Rudiman Creek in Muskegon, and they put the pilings in, and then they come back later and they've sunk. So then they have to put more on top, and then those sink until they get through all of the sawdust and, you know, the muck, basically, to find something hard because it's spongy from what's been in there for fill. And then you had the erosion, all the topsoil. Yeah, I mean, yep, yeah, because, I mean, if you look at that, that last picture of the river I show, I mean, there's no vegetation there to hold 
any of that erosion back. So any major, you know, rainstorms are going to wash all of that in and erode the shoreline there. So this is the White River? Yes. Here. Yep, that is the White River. Are we looking north or are we looking, I mean, upriver? Yep, you're looking upriver. Yep, okay. so White Lake would be over here and you're looking okay. upriver. Right. So, so White Hall, really Montague. Was, uh, what's just north of where now it's just empty land, that was there was built up on that side of it too. On the right side. Mm, yeah, there's some buildings the like this here. Yeah, that's yeah. all empty land. I mean, that's all empty marsh. Well, and this is might be a little bit closer in than, than yeah, than well, what? There's the railroad bridge, which is still there. Okay, yeah. That's now a footbridge, mm -hmm. a bike path. Yeah, because I mean the men that worked out here, they needed, you know, buildings. Yeah. There would have been probably a, one of these was where like they would go to get their lunch and stuff because they're kind of out from town while they're working out there. So they would have built some different buildings out oh, there. Yeah, that's what I'm just saying. If there, was, mm -hmm. if there wasn't, there was building along the White River side north of the, mm -hmm. I mean, up river from the bridge. Mm -hmm. huh. I didn't know that. Okay. If you if you look on the yellow uh, railroad bridge, you can see the piling yeah, yeah. that's left from that. And of course, it's straight, and rivers are not straight. Not mm -hmm. natural flows. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you can see over there the pilings, and I assume that was booming ground. Yeah, that was yeah. booming ground. But that's what that is. But that looks like even more than just booming grounds over there. Yeah, because there's actually, I see what you're saying up here. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple buildings. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's not the clearest picture to tell exactly what's going on up there, but. All right, well, thank you guys all for coming. And if you well, the Cobra was this. I got, I got a mountain of those. Yeah. When I was in my youth, you could, you could come home with, I mean, you yeah. could come home with tons of those. They were down there.